As everyone who watched one of my recent videos, the Blog TV introduction video, will no doubt be aware, I have something of a collection of various clock radios. Most of the radios and clocks that showed up in that video were mine, though a couple were borrowed from my dad and various other places as well. Well, ordinarily a lot of them wouldn't be particularly video worthy because there just isn't anything special to say about them. And this little Micronta clock is probably not too much of an exception. Yet there are some things about this clock that are very, very cool. First of all, it's an early electronic digital clock with a neat vacuum fluorescent display as you can see right there. It actually has a green filter over it that this camcorder doesn't make obvious, though I can see it quite clearly. Secondly, because it's something that Radio Shack released to market in their 1980 catalog, it is a good example of an early electronic digital clock with microcontroller or microprocessor control, if you could call a dedicated purpose clock controller a microprocessor, because in a way it is. This unit has an automatic dimming function that allows it to vary the intensity of the display based on how bright the conditions in the room are. So when it's dark in your room, it will darken the display considerably. When the sun is shining in through your window, it will brighten the display considerably so that you can see it reliably. The model number on this little clock is 63-817A. And again, this was produced in the early 1980s, late 1970s. Now this thing has some fairly unique behavior. For example, if I plug it in right now, which I am going to do here in just a moment, it takes a moment to properly initialize itself most of the time. The other thing that you can notice, and really the main reason for this video, is the shockingly good condition that this vacuum fluorescent display is in. This thing has excellent emission. There's no unnaturally dim spots in it or excessive wear on any particular set of characters. It's just in amazingly good condition, which tells me that this is a fairly low hours unit. Here's the automatic dimming function in action. If I go ahead and zoom in on the display here and then cover the dimming sensor with my finger, you'll see the display drop in intensity quite a bit. And likewise, when I release my finger, the display will grow bright again. This thing has a big cabinet for an electronic digital clock. And while it looks like there's some scuffs and markings on it, most of that is just sticker residue. Here at the back, you can see some unused ventilation holes. You can also see this circular area for a speaker. And clearly, whoever designed this must have had thoughts of putting a speaker that was actually the size of that hole in this unit. But that never happened. So there's just a small cutout there for the actual speaker that is used. Yet in an interesting twist, the speaker in this clock is actually not located there at all. It's actually located in the bottom of the casing, which is mostly empty, even for a fairly early electronic digital clock such as this one. So let's go ahead and pop this thing apart and have a look inside. Now with the cover off, you can see what's inside this little clock, starting with the display tube. Now that dark spot up in the corner there is actually the getter or the material that was put inside the display as it was sealed and vacuum pressurized or rather all the air taken out of it. Pressurized probably isn't the most appropriate term to use though it could certainly fit but that getter is over there to absorb any stray gases that the vacuum pump could not remove when the display was first manufactured. If that was to turn a milky white or even a reddish color, it might mean bad news for the display, that it had somehow lost its vacuum over the years. This one is kind of a dark silver color, and so we know the vacuum is still good. There you can see the color filter for the display. You can kind of get uh, an idea of its actual color from the lights reflecting off of my ceiling fan. And you can see the clock's logic board in there with the ribbon cable leading up to the top button controls. Likewise, if we move things around the right way here and get everything where it belongs, you can see the speaker, the piezoelectric beeper actually, that is used to sound the alarm. It's actually mounted in the bottom of the clock and not particularly close to that speaker opening in the back. Looking up here again, 
on the back of the display whoops come on camera focus you can see the uh, nipple that was used to evacuate it at manufacturing time you can also see the controller chip I'd like to know more about this particular controller it has the uh, Toko Corporation of Japan's logo on it that's the RCL that you see there and as you can see it is an MK 50372N which I have come to understand might actually mean that this is this part was originally designed by Mostec, the same people who designed and developed the 6502 processor and later became a, div a division of the Commodore Corporation. With the cover off this thing, you can see the actual color of the display tube, which is a bright bluish green sort of a color. The display, like so many others of its kind, was manufactured by Futaba of Japan. In closing, there are a couple of other interesting functions that this clock has, and interesting behaviors in its programming or logic. If the alarm is set, most alarm clocks will only go off when they turn over the next minute that happens to match the program time for the alarm. This one is different. As long as the minute value is exactly correct, this thing will sound the alarm the moment the alarm switch is slid on. So clearly it performs a comparison against the current time versus the alarm time and not just when the minute simply rolls over to the appropriate prescribed hours and minutes value. When you turn the alarm on, one of the time separators or colons stops blinking as you can see. The bottom one remains constantly lit. This clock also has a date feature. Now the buttons on top of the clock are dirty, so, to, so pressing the buttons tends to result in some interesting or not totally correct behavior. And that will happen here when I press the snooze bar, which is labeled snooze date. It will display today's date. Well, that time it actually worked properly. Most of the time it sits here and kind of vacillates between displaying the uh, portions of the time and the AM indicator. I'm not sure if the colons are supposed to remain lit, but they do. And when you release this, the time goes back to the normal time display. So you can request at any point in time to see today's date. And while it has no concept of the year and therefore should not care about post year 2000 issues or anything like that, it has the ability to properly handle a leap year. And my guess is that if you left this thing plugged in for four years from the date of your last leap year, that it might well remember that in four years' time there's supposed to be another leap year. So that's about everything there is to say about this little clock. Thank you for watching, and feel free to leave a comment if you have one.